So, in, in talking about cyanobacteria and cyanotoxins, is there just one type of cyanobacteria that we should worry about, or is there more than one type? So um, there's lots of different types of cyanobacteria and not all of them will produce um, toxins, but it does get a bit more sort of complex than mm. that because there's not just one type of cyanotoxin either. So some of cyanotoxins are hepatotoxins, so they affect your liver. Okay. And unfortunately, these ones have chronic effects as well. So they'll promote liver tumors. Um, and that's why yeah. these have quite low regulatory levels yes. is because they have these chronic effects and other cyanotoxins, they're neurotoxins, so they affect the functioning mm. of your brain, but also your nerves. And so these ones, they um, sort of cause animals which have um, eaten too much of them to suffocate. They can't okay. control their breathing anymore. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so we'd sort of call these sort of acute risk. So, um, you know, they're not going to cause you long term effects, but if you get too much mm. of them, you're going to die. Um, and so because there's these different toxins getting produced, um, we sort of actually test for them in different testing suites as well. Mm. So, you know, when you sort of ring up to get your toxin testing, mm. um, you know, you'll be confronted with, oh, what type of toxins do you want to test for? Mm. And to be able to figure out what we might be testing for, that's when we look at these microscopy results. So yes. what type of cyanobacteria are present and which toxins do we know they produce? Or even better is if we mm. have those gene screen re re um, results. So mm. we were looking for the genes responsible for toxin production because different genes are responsible for producing different types of toxins. We mm. actually look for the suite of them and then we can tell you, look, you've got a saxotoxin risk there or you've got an anatoxin mm. risk or you've got a microcystin risk. So you only need to actually test for those type of toxins. Mm. Mm. And, and the type of the type of toxin matters because in terms of the treatment technology for removing it, um, mm. some of them will have different effects. Yeah, like a large amount of the toxins get dealt with with chlorine, but not all of them. Yeah, so I think microcystins, um, chlorination is effective for them, but um, anatoxins, mm. I don't believe that um, chlorination will actually remove that. So yeah, actually understanding um, what type of cyanobacteria and what type of cyanotoxins you might have mm. in your water supply can really help with figuring out what type of treatment processes we'd want on the downstream mm. end. There's not sort of a one size fits all um, scenario unless mm. you want mm. to get into sort of experience ex expensive treatments like these sort of activated carbon, um, removing yeah. all organic yeah. compounds from the water. I guess the other level of complexity to that as well is that, say, the um, regulation safety test for anatoxin yes, yes. as a generic term, but really anatoxin is a whole range of different compounds mm, mm. and different, um, different Anatoxin tests can include different ones of those compounds and some can be a lot more toxic than others. Mm, so yeah. uh, it might be a good idea for water providers to look into, you know, a service provider's range of tests included in an anatoxin test and see mm, what mm. compounds are actually tested for and, and, and go from there. It's quite important to understand the content yeah. of that test. Yeah. So for New Zealand, um, that's quite relevant because um, here we have a lot of benthic cyanobacteria which grow in rivers mm. and the type of anatoxin that they produce are these dihydro anatoxin mm -hmm. congeners um, and so those were recently included as a compound of concern in the WHO um, yes. guidelines yes. so you'll note that it's anatoxin A and analogs and so those and oh, analogs are um, these other congeners okay. and so our benthic cyanobacteria might produce quite low levels of anatoxin A, but mm. it actually produces really high levels of these dihydro congeners, um, which in the past sort of people weren't as interested in. Mm. Um, mm. They sort of thought they were byproducts and nothing to worry about, but there's been some recent work which has shown that actually um, by oral means of mm. ingesting that toxin, so drinking water, mm. Um, mm. You know, actually dihydrocongeners are more toxic than the anatoxin A. Okay, yeah. 
So I guess, um, let's say, put a scenario out there, if I am a private water supplier and I have a relatively big community that I'm servicing, how would I know what to test for? You know, I've, I've heard of these new drinking water standards, I've heard about these things called cyanobacteria. What do I do? Mm, so I wouldn't jump in at the cyanotoxin level, I'd jump in at that sort of base knowledge level. Mm. So um, at that, do I have cyanobacteria yes. in my water supply? And you know, from that, we do microscopy. That tells us the type of cyanobacteria that are mm. present. And from that, we actually get some clues about what cyanotoxins are gonna be likely. Yeah. yeah. And you know, that next step is, um, so I've got cyanobacteria present, mm. um, elsewhere in the world, they sometimes do produce toxins or it's been reported before. Mm, mm. So then we move into that gene screen. And at that point, we get a sort of indication about what type of cyanotoxin might be present. Mm. And then we can move on to the testing. So it's sort of building up that knowledge base progressively yes, and, yes. you know, getting information which guides us on to the next step. Because, mm. you know, what we don't want is, you know, sort of um, people just having to jump in, um, grab a water sample, yeah. test for all types of toxins to cover everything. A much mm. more efficient way is to understand what's present and drive it from that base mm. knowledge towards that refined testing for actual cyanotoxins. Yeah, yeah. So I guess is this something that the likes of Cawthorn can help me understand as, as a private water supplier that I'd get in touch and say, you know, I'd like to understand what my risk is. Is this something that you can help with? Yeah, so water providers are more than welcome to give us a call. So mm. you can either call us at the lab or call JP directly or our consultants and mm. ask just those questions. Mm. Um, it's part of our package of services. Of course, we can offer directly the testing services, but mm. if they want advice as to how to approach that question, mm. That's, mm. Yeah. that's part of the the calls from offer. And I think, you know, the the really good thing for a water supplier um, getting your testing done through Corfron is being able to combine those multiple pieces of information together. So mm. because we mm. do sort of the microscopy for cyanobacteria, we do the gene testing and we do the cyanotoxin testing for the range of cyanotoxins that are present, um, you know, we can actually step through all of that testing mm, on mm. your behalf. So, you know, we can customize how you want things done and we can talk about that. So if you send sort of a non-preserved sample and a preserved sample, mm, we mm. can do the microscopy, automatically trigger gene testing, automatically trigger cyanotoxin testing yeah. and roll yeah. it right through. You don't need to sort of get a call that says, oh, can you go collect another sample? And then we do that yeah. and then get another call <laughs> and collect another sample, yeah, yeah. you know, we two, can two months of... later, you kind of know what's happening. And... Yeah. <laughs> but at the same time, if customers like to have a say in whether to go into the next test or not, we definitely can offer that as well. Mm. So we can customize mm. the way that we go about that sequence. Yes, mm -hmm. yes. And I guess that's where the, this combines quite nicely with our Lutric and Assist. So I guess once you have that understanding of what you have in your water and your risks, that's where someone like ourselves um, mm. can come along and really kind of look at that holistically in terms of your treatment processes and then recommends what treatment processes you might need to reduce this risk. Um, and I guess we can also help with that sort of framework around, you know, um, that whole risk management plan or monitoring plan. So with input from the likes of yourselves just to... Indeed, because yeah. it, it, yeah, I, I think at least to me it's equally important, you know, the, the nuts and bolts, what the operator has to do mm. or the sample collection guy, you know, what, what is he... What is he looking at? Why is he looking at it? And what sort of frequency? Mm, you know, that mm. kind of thing. Because, um, you know, taking the samples is, is the way that you know what's going on. Mm. Um, without that sort of supporting information and, and the, I guess, strategic or tiered way to address what's going on in your source and what you're seeing and what's coming back from these results that you're getting. Mm, um, mm. You know, it's, yeah, it's, it's not going to be an effective plan. Um, yeah, and I guess you guys are in a different, um, a similar scenario um, to the testing as well. Um, you know, actually having that base knowledge means you can recommend, um, you know, the most economical yeah. solution. You don't want 
to actually be investing a whole whack of mm. money into a treatment process which is providing actual no benefit um, you know if yeah. you've got the, a different type of cyanotoxin mm. there that isn't mm. going to be removed yes. from it you don't want to chuck money into that you want to chuck it into something which will cause uh, exactly and, and equally i mean in, in terms of like sampling you know you really want it to be i guess the best bang for the buck you know yeah. like talking about this tiered approach and you know the uh, a council only really wants to be sampling what they need to sample to reasonably understand what's going on you know so yeah it's um it's basically about balancing that risk and mm. the mitigations together um to make sure that they basically the water's kept safe. You know? mm, mm. So yeah, it's a more of a rounded sort of approach. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 yeah that's where the plan comes into uh, really good use, where you have uh, certain actions. So you are targeting what sampling and responses you need to make to, uh, yeah, optimize your expenditure. Because mm. mm. it costs you to send a person out there again exactly. to get some of your follow up. Yeah. 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 Yeah, exactly, exactly. Absolutely, and and the cost of uh, <clears throat> of doing something like um <clears throat> of carbon dosing, for instance, mm. you know, that might be thousands of dollars a day, and based on what exactly, you know, yeah, it's exactly yes, it is, it is, it is great that you turn turn the carbon dosing on when you suspect something something might be happening, but how big actually is mm. the risk? You know, mm. is it the right mm. thing to be doing? Um, and the same talking about investing large amounts of money and building a new treatment process to filter a fast mm, mm. oxidation UV system, you know, um, how much <laughs> how much really is it going to protect you? You know, the answer may be that yes, there is a risk, and yes, you do need that treatment process once every once every I don't know five years for four weeks at a time. Um, but yeah, it's it's about making sure that the it really comes down to understanding that source. Mm. And, um, you know, making the best guess with the information that you have available.